Um, I did want to answer Nikki. It was a I, good question. I have a feeling it like it's no, but well, it it only in certain cases. Okay. It has to be able to um if you draw one resonance structure, yeah. you draw the next one with this with them moved. If there's a spot they can continue to move okay. without leaving too much behind, then then yeah, the, the classic example of that is benzene. Um, we can't really tell the difference between. Oh, um, we can't really tell the difference between different um, different electrons. It's they're part of what makes them electrons is that they're identical to each other. See if I can move this. That's as far down as I can move it. Um, so I guess it's, it's a little bit hard to answer, but in general, we can think about them as being able to move continuously, right? So if we don't, and I'm not sure we really have a way we can test this hypothesis, but that's thought to be part of what, what makes benzene and aromatics in general so stable. It's that, that they're in a ring structure means they can continuously move in the same direction. Hello. But since they're all really existing, it's a probability cloud. It's not really so much movement as it just exists all the way around the circle. And you can't really tell the difference between this set of electrons and the next one. So it's kind of, it's, it's kind of like they're really, I'm not sure that there's a way to answer that definitively, but we would think, and I'm trying to think of a linear example Typically, if it's a linear example, you run out of room because if you're moving electrons away from something, you're moving towards the other end, right? And if you've got a whole bunch of pi electrons that are all conjugated, something at the end now has too many electrons, right? You can't keep forcing right. more electrons that way. So a ring structure would be the time to do that, but we don't really think of it as, um, as discrete objects at this point. It's all sort of one cloud. Um, so I think that it's probably more um, like it does. If, if we're not breaking any of our rules to draw that resonance structure, draw it. But just know that it's not really that the electrons are moving so much as they're smeared out over larger area. Hey Rob, um, if you have your computer with you, you haven't submitted the quiz from this weekend because you saw they were locked at the time, right? Um, I can't get that to replicate on my computer for the studio right now, but if you could screenshot what you're looking at and then send it to me. Sure. Um, so I can send it to the Canvas people for documentation. Intermittent problems are the worst, just like for mechanics, right? You take your car and like sometimes it makes this awful noise and they're like, cool, I can't do anything with that. Um, it's the computer yeah. problems the same. Same thing, you need to be able to document. I don't know if you got my message from Canvas, but I sent you a couple of screenshots. Oh, did you? Okay. So I, I went to grade so I could look at everybody's questions from the computer and immediately saw that nobody turned in anything with it. And so I figured out what had happened right away and then immediately got into trying to solve it. So I didn't look at the, uh, your email yet, but I'll thank you. Yeah, I know it They just Oh, see, what I mean, thank you for sending me the screenshots yeah, so, so that I can attach those. That's the same thing that happened to me this morning when I tried to do it with student view. It showed up as locked once, and then I went back to it to screenshot it, and, it, and the picture showed up fine. So um, we'll see if I can track this down with, with Canvas, the um, software company, um, this week. And so hopefully this weekend, and I, what I'll do this weekend is I'll just, I'll read you all the figures. It's, you know, a little bit more work for me, but that should get around it. It seems like it's the importing from a previous course. It's never caused a problem before, but I think if I re-upload them all myself, um, when I set up the quiz this week, then it should be okay. So keep trying the quizzes. We'll get them working. <clears throat> In the meantime, we'll just work through the problems together. So um, the bulk of the problems this, this weekend were about one molecule. Um, just use this as an example. I don't remember specifically what this molecule is. 
um, off the top of my head while you're working on this. See if I can figure that out just for fun. Um, but yeah, start with the molecular formula, go through all the carbons and look at their hybridization, figure out the number of lone pairs. And then specifically, I and I redefined this in the problem, but um, uh, delocalized just means lone pairs that, are, that you can draw resonance structures with. It means if they're delocalized, they're able to be spread out more than we would normally expect a lone pair. So if it's a lone pair that can participate in resonance, we call that delocalized. So out of all the lone pairs that you can find here, how many of them are delocalized? when you're doing the molecular formulas for these counting carbons, especially with these fused rings, the trick is to make sure that you don't double count them. Temptation say, oh, there's a hexagon and a pentagon, that's 11, except that they're sharing the two of them, right? So just be careful with that. Make sure you start from a consistent spot. And a lot of times it's helpful just to go through and write, um, just count carbons by writing number on them. And then the trick is, if you do this, count your carbons, the trick is don't confuse yourself when you go back to count your hydrogens later, right? So, and I typically do 
about the same thing where you just keep a tally on the side um, for the number of hydrogens, but two, four, zero, zero, five, six, zero, zero, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, thirteen, fifteen, sixteen, zero. 18, 21, unless I missed anything. And then nitrogen's option, it's easy, right? There's no trick to this. It's just when you with the bigger molecules, the trick is just don't confuse yourself. Go through sort of systematically, make sure that you don't double count. Um, again, with ring structures, if you don't do something like to mark it off as you go, it's really easy to count the same carbon twice because you forget if you think oh, I started in this one, but then you get around and like, oh, did I start here or there? And, you know, we're all pretty good at counting at this point in our in our academic careers, but at the same time, it's an easy place to trip up. So um so for the carbons. We're doing hybridization, just a matter of looking at pi bonds, right? Every pi bond you see on a carbon lowers its hybridization one. So all the tetrahedral carbons are going to be sp3. I'm just going to circle them in red, all the sp3 carbons. And then we don't have any carbons that have two pi bonds to the same carbon, right? So we're not gonna have any SPs. The remaining carbons are all gonna be SP2. Questions on those? Good. Would that be the seven point as well? Yeah, if, if you if you want to use color and you label it, as long as you write out, you know, red is SP3 and blue is SP2, I'm totally fine with that. Or pen and pencil. Or pen and pencil. Um, make, if you're gonna do that, just because it, that doesn't always show up easily on a on a picture, um, um, I would do something like circle the SP3s and square the SP2s or something like that. Um, but yeah, that's acceptable too to save yourself some time. Yeah, and well, I mean, you know me, I don't like multiple choice questions in general, and I don't trust the Canvas auto grader as it is. So I'm always going to be a do your work, take a picture of it, and upload it for your answer, um, especially when the class is small. I'd much rather see what you do rather than see if you can type it in the same format as, as I was expecting, right? Because I can never guess all the different possible correct ways of typing something in. <laughs> I forgot to mention, I'm, I think I've told you guys that I'm teaching up a, a class at the high school with a bunch of, you know, 16, 17, 18 year olds right now for our, our Chem 100 class. They're doing it through a program called Dual Enrollment. Um, so I actually have to teach it at the high school. Um, and in the high schoolers, they're not used to getting like a less than like eight or nine out of 10. And I forgot to warn them about the auto grader on Canvas since I woke up on Monday morning to just have a flood of emails. <laughs> Will you take the quiz? I got such a low score. I can't handle this. All right, lone pairs. So no carbons with a negative charge. That's the only time you see carbon with a lone pair is if you've got a carbon ion. Um, so we're just looking at the oxygens and nitrogens. Every oxygen that has two bonds also has two lone pairs. Nitrogens get three bonds and one lone pair. All right, so. So again, counting lone pairs is pretty straightforward. If we want to know how many of them are delocalized, we just have to look at the ones that are adjacent or allylic to a pi bond. 
is our number one clue that a lone pair is going to be, especially if we don't have any charges on the molecule. If you have charges on the molecule, then that means there might be something, if you have a, a positive charge on a carbon that's near a lone pair, you might have a resonance structure there, right? Like we practiced um, with no positive charges anywhere in here. Um, then we're pretty much just looking for where is there a lone pair allylic to a pi bond? Because we need to be able to move them and then still have a way to make room for the new bond that we're forming. So the first one that comes to mind is this nitrogen, because this looks really similar to some of the examples we did, right? We even did this exact functional group drawing up a resonance structure for it, right? You would have to make room for it, but then you can move that, move that long pair over to wind up with something that looks like this. And then the rest of the molecule is still there as well. But then you wind up with the nitrogen with the positive charge and oxygen with the negative charge, but everything still has a full valence. Um, and we just we just shared those those um, lone pairs differently, right? So if you can draw a resonance structure, following all of our rules, resonance structures with a lone pair, then it's delocalized. Delocalized doesn't necessarily mean it's spread over the entire molecule, it just means that it's not locked into one position the way we would normally draw it. We really have these, this lone pair and this pi bond are sort of all sort of spread out over this whole area. Right, so that's what we mean by delocalized. Throughout the other credit, if we're just with structure that has a positive charge, so let's try it. I'm going to clear this real quick. So, in that case, we'd be moving a pi bond over this way, right? Or so we moving a lone pair over this way, and this pi bond. If the, if the nitrogen already has eight electrons, there's nowhere we can put the lone pair that would make room to make a triple bond between the carbon and the oxygen. There, right? Um, plus, the other way you can think about it is if if you would have to make a triple bond to this carbon, this carbon, we'd have to break one of the sigma bonds, right? Because you can't have a triple bonded carbon that's also attached to two other things, right? That would give it five bonds. And we know that we never break a, a sigma bond when we make a resonance structure. Right? So there's two kind of clues there, but when and now try it and see if something looks off. Like if you try to take this and redraw it, you wind up giving something too many electrons. So with that in mind, that answers the second part here, right? These two lone pairs are not delocalized. So if you have a lone pair that's not in the allylic position, it's not one bond away, it's attached to one of the atoms, it's already in a pi bond, that's not going to participate in resonance. They're, they are localized. They're stuck there. And so our nitrogen is delocalized, but those two oxygen ones are not. I said the word localized, but we don't really say that. We don't describe lone pairs as being localized. We just describe them as delocalized, um, which is, I don't know why that is exactly, but that's, we don't say lo localized. We talk about localized orbitals, but that's in a computational setting. Um, it's not anything we're dealing with. So uh, in general, we just say not delocalized. It's a double negative, but that's actually the, the way that the chemists would, would usually phrase that. All right, our other atom that has a lone pair that could be delocalized is this oxygen, and it is allylic to a pi bond, right? So we could draw a resonance structure 
that looked like moving a pair of one of these pi bond electrons over and moving one of these lone pair electrons over to get something that looks like So we wind up with a negative charge on a carbon and a positive charge on the oxygen. But everything still has full valences at least. And we didn't break any of our rules or break any sigma bonds. Everything still has a proper number of electrons. Um, so while this might not be as stable as, as everything with a charge of zero, this is a valid resonance structure, which means that pair of electrons is delocalized. But only one of the two pairs on the oxygen is can be delocalized, right? And like we were talking about earlier, Nikki, we can't really distinguish between the two lone pairs because they're they're identical to each other. But at the same time, one of them is going to have its orbitals sort of smeared out, mixed in with the benzene ring and delocalized. And the other one is going to be stuck. In, in one position, not delocalized, right? So, and so for both of those atoms that have, let's talk about the nitrogen first. If this nitrogen has a delocalized lone pair, what's the hybridization, or not the hybridization, what is the um, geometry gonna look like? Remember, it's going to be trigonal planar. And I hesitate to say, to call it hybridization because it's, if we just counted number of electron groups, we would say that it looks like it should be sp3, right? But its shape is going to behave more like it's sp2. So there's some sort of a gray area when you have delocalized lone pairs as to what the hybridization actually is. So we'll just talk about the geometry for atoms with lone pairs that are, that might be delocalized. So the geometry here is going to be trigonal planar. And how about over here? What is this one going to look like? That's what we would expect if it didn't have a delocalized lone pair, right? It looks like it should be sp3 tetrahedral, but because it can form this um, resonance structure, we get the same thing over here. That oxygen is also going to be trigonal planar um, electron geometry, where we wind up with these bonds being 120 degrees from each other, and this lone pair being 120 degrees roughly from the other. So you wind up with it flattening out and not being tetrahedral. Um, and we can see that when we do things like, I, and again, this is one of the ways that we can we can show that these these resonance structures do really exist is this sort of they call it a superposition um, of all of the possibilities is because if we can actually look where the electron density is on a molecule like this, and we'll see that um, not only do we have something that looks kind of like a pi bond between the oxygen and the carbon. We will also have our lone pair at 120 degrees and in the same plane as the other two bonds, um, as opposed to if it was behaving tetrahedral, we would have these two lone pairs sticking up, up and down, right? Not only would we not have that pi bond, we would have the electrons above and below the ring structure instead of in the plane of the ring structure. So we can demonstrate that to some extent. We have to get really clever with how we measure electron density experimentally to make sure we're not just feeding ourselves circular logic, right? If we're calculating what these geometries and structures are based on the assumption that resonance structures exist, we can't use them to prove that resonance structures exist because we started from that assumption, right? Um, but we do have better and better imaging methods now that we are actually able to um, is actually really cool. Um, you can use scanning tunneling electron microscopes um, 
to, to actually measure where electron density is at the atomic level now. There's some really cool figures that have come out in the last few years. Um, We would normally just say STEM, um, but because that's going to give um, that's going to get confuse everything with so there's uh, there's more and more. Um, movement towards not having everything stuck behind paywalls for um, academic research, but the way that they're doing it, the publishers aren't taking the hit for that. Um, if you publish through one of these major journals and you want your article to be available to everyone for free, um, the person writing the article has to pay the publisher $1,000 um, to give everybody access to it, which is not that much. You can pull it out of your grant funds. It's not like it's coming out of their pocket, but that's so ridiculous that we're subsidizing the publishers for no good reason. Um, if you ask, I feel strongly about tables, as you can tell. Um, just because it's, it's really cool to see that we can actually measure this, um, directly. I, I'll, all right, I'll, I'll try and find that figure on the, spend too much time here. All right, but this was the bulk of the, the um, quiz was the small, was answering these questions. And then I had one that has, um, where we can draw a number of resonance structures um, and then rank them from most to least significant. So let's try this one. Don't forget that there are lone pairs on that oxygen, so you might need to do one of those. Um, you might need those lone pairs to be delocalized on one or more of your resonance structures. Mm -hmm. 
at least let's say at least four plus the one that was given here. Going from memory, that sounds great. First one, move one pair of pi electrons over, right? We're just going to keep doing that. For all of these moved one pair of pi electrons over, which left a vacant spot out. And we can keep going with that. Again, a lot of times it can be helpful to draw your carbon structure out before you start filling in all the pylons, especially the ones that, that have moved, get everything in the right spot and then compare it to where you started and how you drew your arrow to make sure you don't lose a carbon. There's gonna be one more that falls moving a pi bond. Ran out of space over here. It's arguing with me about that. So pretend like I actually was my draw the other metal group over here, but it's not really participating in the resonance, so it doesn't really matter. And so we have three more resonance structures just by moving the pi bonds. But that creates a positive charge adjacent to some long pairs, right? And so one of those long pairs can participate in the, in the um, resonance as well. Get a final resonance structure. That's going to look like a 
this with a positive charge on the oxygen. So it's got three bonds instead of two. So out of these five possibilities, are any of them going to be noticeably more or less stable than the others? And what's your reasoning? Because uh, it's got more electric negative uh, atoms, so it's more to attract more electric material. You would be correct, except if there's a there's a bigger issue here, which is that that's the only structure where everything has a full valence. All of the ones where you've got a positive charge on a carbon, all of those carbons don't have a complete valence. So this one is is actually the most stable because it's the only resonance structure where they all have a full valence, despite the fact that it puts a positive charge on the oxygen. That's our second tier of deciding stability. It's all, you know, with the equal number of valences being built, a positive charge on the oxygen is less stable than a positive charge on a nitrogen, say. But if that's our only case for getting all of the valences built, that's more important. So this last structure would be the most stable, most significant. But then we also are going to have, um, and then these other ones are pretty close to the same, right? Because they're all carbocation. They're all positive charge on a carbon. Um, they are one way we can distinguish between these. Um, they're all relatively close to the same, but if we're if we're splitting hairs, we'd say anytime we can put a positive charge on a tertiary carbon is more stable than putting a positive charge on secondary, which is more stable than putting a positive charge on primary. So for these positive charges, most stable is with the most other carbons around it. And, and so that gives us a few of these in like tier two level of stability. Right. Space of five minutes, and should lose both of the No, there's one right there. Right. And so that would make actually this one is the only one that's a tertiary carbocation, right? So that one's slightly more stable than the other three carbocations, but it's not as stable as this one. And again, that's a secondary level of, of splitting hairs, right? All of these carbocation ones have the same number of incomplete valences. So then we go to um, which of them puts the positive charge someplace where it's a little bit more stable, just like with the electronegative elements. So between those three that are left, which one would be the most stable? They're all going to be relatively identical because they're all secondary carbocations. And there's not there's nothing else that I can see that would make any of them more stable than the others. What about having all the charge of the carbon that's like right next to the oxygen? Is that that's what I was thinking as well? Um it's far enough away that other than the fact that that means it can get to the oxygen with a positive charge and, and having everything filled, um, it's it's really pretty identical. The fact that they're all secondary um, carbocations is, is going to be the dominant factor. Um, just having a positive charge near an oxygen does not make something less stable unless there's some new resonance that it can be created like we did there. Um, but you can't get to this resonance structure without also having these other two. So these other two are going to also be the same kind of level of stability that way.
All right. Any other questions on this one? Um, I did find an article. This is from a, a group in uh, Berkeley. So the way that they do scanning tunneling micros uh, microscopy works very similarly. This is called non-contact atomic force microscopy, but it's pretty simpler. Um, basically, you get a really, really, really fine needle to the point where it's only a couple of atoms at the point of the needle, and you dangle it above a surface, just a little bit away from the surface. Um, so this actually has it, this is attached to basically kind of like a, a needle on a record player. Um, but it's measuring the force up and down on the needle. So very similar to a record player, actually, except instead of turning it into um, sound waves, it's turning it into voltage and current. And so by measuring that current, um, we're able to basically use the, just put a, this looks like they're using carbon monoxide at the, on the tip because that oxygen is going to have lone pairs on it, right? It's a polar molecule that has a partial negative of that oxygen. And if you get that close to another electron cloud, electrons push away other electrons, right? And so basically they can drag this over the surface and when it hits extra electron density, the needle bumps up a little bit and they can measure that. Um, and so you can actually do that and you, and you visualize it. You wind up with figures like this, where the light area is more electron density, and the darker area is less electron density, or partial positives and partial negatives. We want to think about it this way. So this is for a larger molecule than just benzene. They were actually able to. Um, this is actually part of what um, led. Part of what led to this is what they um, nuclear the Nobel Prize in Physics this year went to. Um, I don't know. They, they're announcing them this week. Um, and the one for physics was looking at um, uh, these researchers that were able to generate laser pulses that are measured in terms of attoseconds, which is smaller than femtoseconds, which is smaller than um, picoseconds and nanoseconds. So it's, we're getting to like the 10 to the minus 18 seconds range. Um, and by doing that, they can actually trigger these, these um, organic reactions and then watch them as they progress. What's always held us back is if you shine a light laser on it continuously, you can't be monitoring things because the ongoing laser intensity throws off all your measurements. But now that they've found a way using these attosecond laser bursts, that they stop the laser fast enough that the reaction continues and you can watch the reaction continue using processes like this. Um, so this was actually part of a study where they were actually able to capture intermediates forming over the course of a reaction that was started by um, those attosecond laser bursts, which is kind of cool. They announced chemistry tomorrow, I'm kind of excited. Um, last year's was uh, went to um, Bertosi and Sharpless for designing these new, not really new types of reactions, but they figured out a way they could use some um, organic reactions to link biological molecules to, to signal molecules. So they could do things like attach a, a molecule that I'm um, a fluorescent dye molecule to a protein and then track that protein's movement within a cell. So they could say this protein that we've labeled is being primarily used in, you know, the smooth into plasma particulum or something. And they can actually track how the cell moves proteins around by watching the fluorescence, which is really cool. Um, even cooler that that's one of the reactions that I studied in grad school um, was the Bertozzi reaction, and which was based on Sharpless's research. The so Sharpless is now the third person with, with two Nobel Prizes. Marie Curie, Linus Pauling, and Barry Sharpless from, and he's at UC San Diego now for scripts. Anyway, so I'm excited for tomorrow because last year's was really, really near and dear to my heart. All right, so 
those are the quiz questions. Um, feel free to um, send me an email or just ask right now. But if you think of anything that you that that brings up that you wanted to uh, ask more questions about, um, let me know and you can talk about it in the meeting class on on Thursday. Um, since since the quiz didn't work this week, once again, um, and we'll go from there. Eleven forty five. Normally we go a little bit closer, but this is a as convenient a place as any to stop. It's, I'll refresh your memory as to what assets are real quick. Um, and then you can let that marinate over break. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about them some more. All right, so we're going to be talking about what makes organic molecules acidic or basic. Um, and so just to reiterate what an acid is, we have three definitions from Gen M. The most, the broadest definition is the Arrhenius definition, um, which is just says that in a solution, if you add an acid to water, the solution gets more H pluses floating around, which then eventually they were able to redefine that to say H3O plus. And it turns out you don't have protons just floating around if you're in an aqueous solution, they actually all, all always stick to a water molecule. Um, but for practical, practically speaking, these are pretty much the same thing. We talk about having extra protons floating around, but really we mean extra hydronium, um, but it means the same thing. Fun fact, Svante Arrhenius, the guy who defined this, was a Swedish um, chemist, and he was actually the first person to publish research suggesting that um, the Industrial Revolution was going to cause global climate change due to um, increased greenhouse gases. Um, this was back in like the 1860s. Um, he published, of course, he was he was Swedish, and so he was thinking about it in terms of maybe it won't be so so bold. Um, so he actually thought it might be a net benefit for humanity. But, um, and he, he neglected some important variables that, as far as how, what the intensity would look like. And he didn't take into account things like, um, you know, cataclysmic weather events. He just said, look, on average, the uh, average temperature of the earth has to go up because we have more greenhouse gases and greenhouse gases absorb um, light. So, but yeah, back in the 1860s, the scientific community was already aware that this was an issue. Um, it just took, you know, 140 years before the, the rest of the country kind of got on board with that. Um, the, the definition we will use most commonly for an acids in this class is we're going to talk about it in terms of molecular structures. And so they, we think about it in terms of the Bronsted Lowry definition, which is just an acid is something that can give up an H. Plus. Um, and just a reminder, proton and H plus, if we say it's a proton donor, we're not talking about a nuclear reaction. We're talking about moving an H plus because the hydrogen ion is literally just a single nucleus with no electrons around it. And that nucleus is just a, a proton. There's no neutrons. In it. So if you see proton donor, it means the same thing as an H plus. So it's one of them said, well, so one is talking about from the point of view of the solution. Okay. So Arrhenius is saying from the point of the solution gets more acidic when you add an acid to it. Yeah. And we can measure that by looking at these concentrations. Ron said, and now we're thinking about it from the molecular point of view is the, the molecule that gives away an H plus is the acid as opposed to it just increased the concentration of free H pluses. Yeah. So they're good. So it's like these are almost like three sides to the same point. It's like third person, first person. Yeah, exactly. You shifted the frame of reference, but it's the same, saying the same thing. Um, the last one is a little bit trickier to wrap your head around sometimes. It's a Lewis acid, is something that can accept electrons. It turns out we can have Arrhenius acids that don't have H pluses. If you put iron, in 
If you put iron in water, it winds up being surrounded in this um, octahedral shape by all the oxygens from water. Because there's a partial positive, so the is a charged iron. Draw this one out. Take the next point. If you put iron ions in water, it makes it sort of complex. It actually makes the oxygen and hydrogen bonds weaker to the point where you can actually get them breaking. And the oxygen hangs on to the electrons. And so you actually increase the amount of H pluses in the solution, even though iron ions didn't have any H pluses to begin with. So you can have an acid that meets two, but not all three of our acid criteria which is why we have all three definitions. They're not all saying the same thing because you can have one and three without two. And you can have two and one without three. If you work it back enough, you can see where the electron accepting factors in with those, but it's kind of tricky. Um, it's multiple steps removed. So we're gonna primarily focus on this one, but we, I wanted just to reiterate that all of these can be true, um, but they don't all have to be. All right, let's take our break. Let's come back at five after, and we'll do some practice with this and see how it applies to organic multiples. <laughs> See, so I was there for that. Yeah, so were you there? No, uh, I mean, like, you should talk about a little bit, like, last week. Uh, so this was, uh, this is the main thing. So there's like a symmetry when okay. something goes up, we throw something up, and then um, gravity's like, accelerating it down. Mm -hmm. And so she, like, did the equations. Oh, this is all right. Yeah, I snapped this from the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I do that on there. Um, so she was, she just, so instead of 9.8, she said it's 10. And it's always negative from um, gravity because it's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so then yeah. she like the time equals zero. We found velocity. Mm -hmm. and here she's finding position. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's a quality equation to draw everybody's right on that one. Yeah. <laughs> so this was. Uh, yeah, the only thing that you can time, and then so you can find the velocity is moving like 20, 10, 0, negative 10, negative 20, negative 30. So it's, it should just show that it's symmetrical. And then the position, you know, it's like, it goes up to like 40, 45, and then it comes down 40, and it comes down at the same rate. Um, so that's, yeah, it was just looking at it. 
we started off. So these are the main three equations here. Yeah, for sure. Certainly hit her. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> last week, like, yeah. find the right equation, looking at what, what, you know, what we start with and what we're trying to get to, you know, and then just rearrange the equation to, like, if we're trying to get change y, but we don't have time, then we got to, like, start down here. Sometimes we have to start over here just to get acceleration. And then that. So sometimes it's a two-step, you know, like, start with one equation to get, like, one of your values, and then you can plug that into that second. Um, yes, yeah, same thing. So it's position because now we're doing falling objects, so these are going up, up and down. So it's the exact same thing, it's just moving up and down. Yeah, right. Yeah, so it's the exact same thing. Um, let's see what we can do. We saw the video last week, yeah. but they dropped it. Yeah, so I should start talking about that. Um, I don't know, I think it's just like how she reached. Yeah, it's just this equation oh, here. Yeah. And I think I'm the bubble actually. Yeah. Just, I think these are just the points that we should do. Yeah, that's the same thing as the last thing involved. So, so you can use the max pi x. It's a little more thorough. So, you know, so there's pi x here, like, well, I knew the speed is throw and acceleration, so I can solve for change of y. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you really did. It. She really yeah, this is what she talked about. So like they the plane, they submitted this thing, and like thousands of schools submitted their like projects, and they picked the dust with the TCC and school. They have to go in the plane test thing. They're doing like Again, how bubbles popped and yeah. zero gravity and stuff like that. She she literally had this. She has to do it. No, it's the same part. Here. I'm sleeping. I'm very entertaining. Yeah. So, yeah, you see. It's like the best of your life. Yeah. It looks interesting. It's going to be fun. Thank you.
Oh, I was wrong. There are two others. Murray Curie and Landis Pauling are still the only two to have won two Nobel Prizes in two different disciplines. Because Murray Curie um, got her first one in physics for discovering how radioactivity of atoms worked. Um, and so that's more of a physics problem. And then she discovered several elements as well as a result of her work. And so that gave her the Nobel Prize in chemistry. Um, she also, I love the fact she just gave zero plus. Um, she was on the on the committee that voted to name elements and um, a new element came up and I don't know if it was her idea, but at the very least, she voted in favor of naming an element after herself, which just takes a lot of, you know, confidence. Like, yeah, I've earned this. Name that element after me. If anybody has earned that, it's her. But it's just, you know, usually some, oh, no, I couldn't possibly. No, not very very good. Her, uh, she shared her second Nobel Prize with one of her daughters. Um, and her other daughter um, never won her own Nobel Prize, but was a journalist, a journalist who fought in the French resistance during World War II. The rest of the Curies got out of Europe um, on the strength of, of her scientific career. Um, and I think they moved to America for the at least for the duration of the war. Um, but one of her daughters stayed behind in France to fight in the French Revolution or res resistance on the French Revolution. Um, and then wind up marrying one of the first, um, for the founders of the UN in the aftermath of World War II, um, who won a Nobel Peace Prize for his work in maybe economics, actually. Um, he won a Nobel Prize of his own, though. So I can't remember what the second daughter's name was, but. Mom had two Nobel Prizes. Dad had a Nobel Prize. Her sister had a Nobel Prize. Her husband got a Nobel Prize. She never did, though. Yeah. Um, but then Sharpless and Sanger and Bardeen won Nobel Prizes in the same discipline. Bardeen in physics twice um, and Sanger in chemistry twice. He was a biochemist. Um, still do, we still teach some of the stuff he did in the upper division biochem, and now Sharpless has won it twice in 2000 and 2002. Sorry, 2001, 2022. Uh, um, but let's see if I have a picture of the Sharpless reaction in here. He basically involved, invented a whole new um, field of chemistry twice. <laughs> Once with those quick reactions where they label proteins um, with dyes and things like that. But then his first one, we will actually study some of his work in second or third quarter in OCHEM. Um, the prize, Nobel Prize he won in 2001 um, was basically, he was able to find a way to, to catalyze a reaction so that it, um, the reaction would happen one way, but the mirror image reaction would not happen simultaneously. So he was able to limit it to only making going down one pathway, even though the molecules look identical, they're just mirror images of each other. He was able to make one mirror image, but not the other, um, which was a game changer for synthetic chemistry and, and medicinal chemistry, um, which is, that was pretty cool too. Anyway, um, let's, so acids we talked about, increased H plus or H3O plus concentration. The most relevant for us is proton donor, but then there's that third weird-ish definition that you can sometimes have a Lewis acid that's not a bronsted Lowry acid. Um, if you have some, if you're adding something like a metal ion to water, um, like we talked about. Bases, generally the exact opposite. Right now that, now that y'all understand equilibrium and how auto, auto ionization of water works, um, as far as then, then um, Arrhenius bases make, make sense. Um, Arrhenius acids increase the concentration of H plus ions. Arrhenius bases, you could think of them as being they decrease the concentration of H pluses, which has the, through equilibrium, has the effect of also increasing hydroxide concentration, right? Because remember those hydroniums and hydroxides 
um, are inversely related to each other, right? One goes up, the other goes down. So saying something increases the concentration of hydroxide is means that it also decreases the concentration of hydronium. Right. So when we first present you with acids and bases, it's not the one that doesn't seem to match. These ones are just splits. Bronson Lowry acid is a proton donor, a base is proton acceptor. Lewis acid is an electron acceptor. Lewis base is an electron donor. And those are just flipped. This one, until you understand equilibrium a little bit, it's hard, hard to see how it's just the inverse of the other, but it is still because of that inversely proportional um, relationship. Um, and that also means that Arrhenius bases can work in two ways. They either increase the concentration of hydroxide directly by say, if you added sodium hydroxide to a solution, you're adding hydroxide ions dissolved, right? Which directly increases your concentration. But you can also have an Arrhenius base that works by using up H pluses. Um, and so you don't have to add hydroxide directly. It can be something that's, if you have a good Bronsted Lowry base, it's going to increase the concentration of hydroxide by using up H pluses. And then the same is true. I didn't emphasize this one with the acids, but you can have an Arrhenius acid that works not by adding H pluses, but by using up hydroxides. All right, so just to reiterate some terms that we're going we're gonna to use um, a lot more consistently and often in this class is the idea of a conjugate base and conjugate acid. So remember that the conjugate base is what you get after an acid-base reaction has happened. And a conjugate means if the reaction went backwards. But the other way of thinking about it is that the conjugate base is always going to be paired with the same acid. And so a lot of times we'll talk about conjugate acid base pairs. Because depending on the way you write the reaction, um, they're always going to wind up linked. So for instance, uh, hydrogen carbonate turning into carbonate, these two molecules are always linked as conjugate acid base pairs. Carbonate is the conjugate base of hydrogen carbonate. And conversely, if we have this acting as, if we have hydrogen carbonate acting as, as a base instead of an acid, we have it accepting an extra H plus. Again, CHCO3 minus turning into H2CO3. These are also linked, right? So the conjugate acid of hydrogen carbonate is carbonic acid. The conjugate base of hydrogen carbonate is carbonate. But they're always linked. Um, and so we're going to, a lot of times, we're going to talk about the protonated form versus the deprotonated form in this class because they'll have different properties. Um, and so when we say the protonated form, we mean the conjugate acid of the pair. And it works, it's, it's really easy to see when we look at larger molecules. Um, in fact, if I go back this one, let me clear it off. You can, Protonate any lone pair, really. There's going to be different amounts of um, the sort of a, a priority system for which ones get protonated first. You can add an H plus to any lone pair on a molecule. And so for, for this particular molecule, we, the protonated form is the deprotonated form. The protonated form or the conjugate acid of this, if this whole molecule acts as a base, the conjugate acid would look like the same molecule, except now you've got NH2. 
because you took that lone pair and you stuck an H plus on it. Because lone pair has got electron density and H plus is a positive charge, so it's attracted to electron density. And once you do that, that changes the nature of how this molecule reacts, because now all of a sudden they can't have a delocalized lone pair on that nitrogen, right? Because now what was a lone pair on the nitrogen now is a sigma bond, which means that we actually lost a resonance structure by protonating this, by adding this to this. So we actually use pH a lot of times in organic chemistry to change things like solubility and to control resonance sometimes. Uh, because by adding, by doing this, by making it the protonated form, that changes a lot of macroscopic properties especially um, when it comes to things like solubility. Because this is a polar molecule, but it's got a lot of non-polar sections to it, right? It's got some polar bonds, but it's got a lot. It's a big molecule that's mostly non-polar. That's not going to dissolve very well in water. The protonated form, still not going to dissolve that easily, but it's going to dissolve a heck of a lot better because it has a full-on positive charge on it, right? So it's not just that it's a polar molecule, it's an ion. And ions dissolve in water way better than neutral molecules do. Right? So playing around with solubility, that's actually one way you can purify things is say, okay, I've got this mixture. I'm going to change the pH so that um, the molecule I want no longer dissolves in water. And you're going to get, and we can get it to dissolve in a non-polar solvent instead. And it leaves behind everything else that's dissolved in water. And then we can take it and change the pH of the organic layer or the, uh, the um, organic solvent to add the proton back on, which is going to make it fall out of solution. And now you can get a nice precipitate out of this. We purified it just by changing the pH. Um, so that, that's what we call an acid base extraction. And we'll do examples of that. I'm not sure if that's this week's lab or next week's lab, but either way, we'll have some more examples of that. Um, but the main thing that I wanted to get to impress upon you is this idea that the protonated and deprotonated forms are always linked. If anything, in OCHEM, that's almost easier to see because we're dealing with these big molecules that are very distinctive looking before and after. Um, it's a little bit hard sometimes to see how carbonate and hydrogen carbonate are linked because they're such small molecules. Right, you're right, you're saying that propionated hydroxide ion would be just water. Correct. Yeah, pro if you have propionate hydroxide, um, that's the same thing as saying neutralize. In the gen chem class, we say we neutralize the hydroxide by adding an acid to it. But to use the language that, that we started using here, that's we're protonating the hydroxide um, to make water. And if you protonate the water, you get the hydronium. Right, so they're always kind of paired that way. Um, so here's just another example of, of an entire reaction written out. So rather than just one half of the reaction, if you have an acid, something with an H plus, that can donate the H plus to a base, the products are going to be the conjugate base, which is the acid minus the proton it donated. And the conjugate acid is the base with the extra proton added. And so a lot of times we write these, especially in this class, um, we're going to see reactions where we say we're going to be less concerned with balance in this class because a lot of times we'll just say, well, we need it to be charged. And so now we're just going to add some acid to it. And we don't really balance that necessarily, um, but we'll just say, okay, and then we can go from the neutral to the propionated form by adding an extra H plus. Um, but we're just going to throw it in there because we want it to be propionated. Um, and it's a little bit less about the specific balancing in ratios because almost everything we'll do in here is going to be one-to-one -one. because, again, we're dealing with these large organic molecules. We're not dealing with, you know, taking a solid and turning it into 17 different pieces. All right, so here's some practice, just labeling them. Um, should be reviewed, but it looks a little bit different when we when we put it with organic molecules. So go through and try and label these. 
acid base, conjugate acid, conjugate base for both of these reactions. And then we'll go through it. It's pretty easy to see. Everything's drawn out. You can see exactly what happened, right? That um, this molecule lost an H plus and goes from being neutral to having a negative charge. So this is our acid hydroxide accepted the H plus, which makes it the base. So our conjugate base is the deprotonated form of the acid. And our conjugated acid is the protonated form of the base. Again, same concepts we did in Gen Chem, but I've just reframed it rather than just it's conjugate means it's what happens if the reaction went backwards. Now I'm just thinking more about it in terms of it's the same molecule, just protonated or deprotonated. Down here, the second reaction is a little bit trickier just because it doesn't, you can't look at this initially and see it, have it be obvious where that proton came from. Um, you have to see, for now, we'll talk about how you can predict which of the protons gets pulled off, which of the hydrogens gets broken off. Um, but for now, we can just look at it and say, well, before and after, we have a negative charge over on this part, but we must have broken a hydrogen off of, of this um, hydrogen carbon. So that makes the ketone here, the acid, and this deprotonated nitrogen, nitrogen with the negative charge. So in other words, it's a nitrogen with two lone pairs, right? We're used to seeing nitrogens that are neutral with one lone pair. Um, it turns out nitrogens with a negative charge are really, really good bases. Um, they're a better base than hydroxide. Oftentimes they're stronger base than hydroxide is. Um, so if you have a deprotonated amine, it'll go out and find the hydrogen. So and so that means this is our base. This is our conjugated acid. This is our conjugated base, or conjugate base, rather. So remember how I, I told you that carbocations, the more carbons around, the more stable they get? Carbanions are the exact opposite, as you would expect, because the charges are opposite, right? So that's why it pulls the hydrogen off of this carbon instead of this carbon. It's always going to be the one of the ones that's adjacent to the carbonyl to the ketone uh, because that gives it a resonance structure now, right? Once you deprotonate it, there's now a resonance structure you can make to make it more stabilized. 
and but it preferentially puts the negative charge at the end of the chain because this is more stable than putting it on the middle. But again, we'll go over that in more detail when we um, get to these reactions. Turns out there's a whole class of reactions related to being one carbon away from a um, carbonyl compound. So this is, in general, this is a carbonyl. And there's lots of sub-functional groups, sub-genres, molecules like ketone versus aldehyde versus acid versus um, esters. But turns out being one carbon away from that carbonyl group um, gives you a whole different range of, of reactions that we'll, we'll spend a significant amount of time on in Pokemon 3. Um, there's a three whole chapters on they call alpha carbon chemistry. Um, all right, so the reason that that's relevant now, the reason I bring it up now is the idea that making, being able to make an extra resonance structure when you protonate or deprotonate something um, makes changes how easy it is, how acidic a compound is, right? More acidic compounds basically means they're not holding on to their protons as tightly. It's easier for something to come by and steal a proton from it, the more acidic a compound is. Right. And so um, we have a, a whole functional group called the carboxylic acids. That look like this. These are particularly acidic for the same exact reason um, that we just talked about. Right now, there is no there's not a very stable resonance structure. You can draw a resonance structure, but it's going to look a little bit weird because you're going to wind up with lone pair moving over, the five bond moving over. You get a resonance structure that looks like oxygen with a negative charge, double down oxygen, and H with a positive charge. That's a valid resonance structure. Everything still has full valence. But we did go from neutral to introducing charge and charges, right? This is not, we would not expect this to be as stable as what we started with, right? However, if we deprotonate that oxygen first, we get a different type of resonance structure. If we break that hydrogen off, let's say we just had hydroxide come in here with a negative charge, and it grabs that hydrogen, which allows that oxygen to, that um, pair of electrons to move over. The deprotonated form of the carboxylic acid looks really similar. So now we've got an oxygen with a negative charge. Now, this can make a resonance structure that's just as stable as it is right now. And if we do the same type of resonance structure, we get a functionally identical molecule, right? We're able to share the negative charge between the two oxygens. which again, we can draw a resonance structure here, but it's gonna be a pretty minor contributor because by drawing the resonance structure, we introduce negative charges on both of the oxygens or negative charge on one positive on the other. Positive charge on an oxygen is not very stable, right? But once it's deprotonated, it's really easy to make two resonance structures that are both equally stable. So the deprotonated form is more stable than we would expect because we added a new a more stable resonance. We stabilized one of the resonance structures by deprotonating it. And so that's actually what makes carboxylic acids acids, 
which makes what makes them acidic under just aqueous conditions is the fact that they can give up that H plus so easily. They can very easily donate a proton. Be and it's not because it's unstable the way it is. It's because you can make a product that's more stable if you just deprotonate it. All right, so here's, here's the example of carboxylic acid donating to water. And we get something that has a negative charge on an oxygen, but it can resonate as well. So this is why alcohols are not as acidic. Alcohols are still kind of acidic. You can take the, the hydrogen off of an alcohol. Let me, yeah, let me go back to this one. Here's an example of an alcohol acting as an acid, right? You can do that with any alcohol. But it's effectively just as, as hard as it is to deprotonate water. You're breaking an oxygen hydrogen bond. You've got to have something that really wants that hydrogen in order to do that for life. What makes the carboxylic acids different is the fact that you can make multiple resonance structures with products. All right, so this is. Part of this is um, just gonna be definitions when we talk about, remember um, talking about pKa and when you did equilibrium. There was the buffer equation, kind of used it a little bit. Um, I'm going to reframe pKa in the context of OCAM as well. Um, so, but here's our first definition or our derivation of where pKa comes from. So Ka is always is the equilibrium constant for a weak acid reacting with water, right? And first rule, equilibrium is product of the reactants. So we wind up with Ka is equal to this term. Uh, and then we can do, we can do some algebra, play with law of logs to rearrange this, um, especially if we use the definition of pH means um, is the negative log of H3O plus concentration. And we'll redefine Ka to be the negative log of Ka. We take the negative log of both sides here and do some rearranging. We get that buffer equation, the henderson hasselbach equation, uh, which was the pH equals pKa. plus log of A minus over HA concentrations. And A minus is just the, is the deprotonated form and HA is the protonated form. This winds up being significant in organic chemistry for, for two reasons. One, PKA gives us a really easy way to um, look at how strong acids are relative to each other. A lower pKa means a more acidic acid. Higher pKa means it's a weaker acid. All right, so, and there's, there's tables in textbooks of like, okay, for this functional group or this molecule, here's what what pKa is. So for sulfuric acid, pKa is negative nine. It's really, really strong acid. Um, for something like a protonated carbonyl, it's got a pKa of negative seven. Um, that's also pretty, pretty strong. Anything that has a pKa seven means that when you put it with water, more than more than half the time, or a significant chunk of the time, it will dissociate or it'll act as an acid with water, right? Because water has got a pKa of seven. So anything with a pKa lower than seven, when you put it with water, water will act as the base and that molecule will act as the acid. Anything with a pKa higher than seven, the opposite is true. Water is not a strong enough base to make anything up here act as an acid. And so this just gives us a, a round, a um, way to qualitatively look at 
different molecules in different function groups. That's the one that we saw on the last page. We said, oh, you know, it doesn't seem obvious where there'd be a proton that it could pull off. Um, turns out that carbon one spot away from the carbonyl, it's still got, it's got a pKa of 19. Which is so it's really, really not a very good acid. You have to have a really strong base. A molecule down here, like there's a deprotonated nitrogen. If you have a deprotonated nitrogen that can act as the base, you can make this molecule act as the acid. Right? So we can force reactions to happen by picking and choosing what do we have acting as our acid, what's our base, what's mixed together. How strong is our base? So high pKa means a strong conjugate base. It's a very good base once, once it's deprotonated. Low pKa means it's a strong acid when it's protonated. And the, the opposite of these is also true. If it's a low pKa, it's a strong acid, and the conjugate base is a very weak base. If it's a high pKa, the conjugate base is a really strong base, but the protonated form is really weak acid. And the other thing that charts like this allow us to do is predict where on a larger molecule, what is the proton that's actually going to be lost. Because we have a range of different functional groups here, right? So we have a molecule that's got more than one of these functional groups, and we want to pick out which functional group is the one that will actually lose its proton. We should go, okay, start at the top and go down until you hit one of the functional groups that your molecule has. The highest functional group on this list is the most acidic functional group in that molecule. So for instance, if we go back to here's that OH attached to a benzene ring, that's a molecule called phenol. Um, PHEN as a prefix usually means that it's a benzene ring, and OL means there's an alcohol. So phenol is an alcohol attached to a benzene ring. That hydrogen, the hydrogen that's on the oxygen, has a pKa of 9.9. .9. It's not a great acid, but if you compare it to the other hydrogens on this molecule, all the other hydrogens are pretty close to identical, right? They're all just attached to um, to the carbons benzene, right? If you come, you would have to come all the way down here to get something that looks like taking a hydrogen off of a carbon-carbon five bond. That's got a pKa of forty-four. It's really, really hard to deprotonate an alkene or an aromatic. So if we're looking at this molecule, we're choosing, oh, we have the red proton or we have blue protons. The red one is going to get pulled off first because these ones are so bad at being acids that if we have to choose one, it's going to be the, the one written in red there. It's so for a larger molecule that has several different options, which of these is going to be the most acidic proton or hydrogen? And again, I know I realize it's a little bit hard to read that table on the screen here. But just from what we just discussed, we can look down at the bottom here. I'll zoom in from the bottom here. Carbon-carbon five bonds, so those vanillic hydrogens are really, really hard to pull off, right? Alkanes are even harder. So out of this whole molecule, we can pretty quickly say it's none of the hydrogens that are attached to a carbon. So that leaves us with the OH proton or the nitrogen proton. So now we want to go back and compare and say, okay, well, 
if we look at an alcohol versus an amine, which one is a better acid? So we come back over here again. So we have a couple of different versions of alcohols. There's water, there's a primary alcohol, there's a tertiary alcohol, but they're relatively close together, right? There's hydronium is all the way down here. So hydronium is a pretty good acid. Where do you find amines? So deprotonating a nitrogen, there's more, there's more specifics, obviously there's different, gonna be different pKa's for different types of amine groups. But in general, there's such a big difference between deprotonating an oxygen, to get an oxygen with a negative charge versus deprotonating a nitrogen, to get a nitrogen with a negative charge, pK of 38 versus 18. And remember that pH is a log scale, right? Which means pKa is also a log scale. In other words, it's 10 to the 20 times more difficult to deprotonate a nitrogen than it is to deprotonate an oxygen. So we can we can pretty easily say that all of our alcohols, or there might be some small differences between the alcohols, but there and there's some small differences between the types of amines, but broadly speaking, there's so far apart stability, we can say that all alcohols are easier to deprotonate than all the amines. And so going back to our molecule here. That means if we're choosing between this proton, oh, sorry, let me draw on it. I'm sorry. Between the nitrogen proton or the oxygen proton, we're going to deprotonate here first. Neither of them are great, they are acids, but if you had a strong enough base, um, you could pull the hydrogen off of the oxygen and it would come off of the oxygen before you were able to deprotonate the amine. So say they were both deprotonated, would the amine group take the hydrogen first? Yeah, exactly. And then if you do get to deprotonate both of them, when you go back the other way, when you start adding protons in again, you're going to protonate this first. And it's always an equilibrium reaction, which means there's always a little bit of, well, both things happen at the same time. But at equilibrium, if you have some of these deprotonated and some of these deprotonated, you're going to have 10 to the 20th times more of this deprotonated because there's that difference in 20 on the pKa scale. Yeah. Right? So yes, some of these will be deprotonated as well, but the ratio between the two is 10 to the 20 favoring nitrogen gets protonated first, which when we're dealing with numbers that big, ratios that big, we can effectively say 0% of the, of the nitrogen will be deprotonated. We should, right? We can call it something like a mole. <laughs> but that is that it's as close to out of an entire mole of molecules, one molecule, or a thousand molecules, because it's 10 to the third difference, right? A thousand out of a mole will have the nitrogen deprotonated, and the rest of them would have the oxygen deprotonated. <laughs> no. <laughs> the other way that this is really useful, pK is really useful, and here's where we reframe our, our point of view on it a little bit, is if we go back to our buffer equation, we use this equation with Gen Chem so we could set up, okay, I want to make a buffer at this pH. I can mix these um, conjugate acid base pairs at this ratio to make a buffer and get the pH to be exactly what it, or close to what I want it to be. However, the other way of thinking about this is if pH equals the pKa, pH equals pKa, that means this term has to be equal to zero for that to happen, right? And how do you get a log of something to be equal to zero? Log of one is equal to zero, right? The only way you can get a log of one 
is if the top of this fraction equals the bottom of this fraction. Which means if pH equals pKa, you've got a 50-50 mixture of the protonated and deprotonated form. Okay, well, what does that get us? It gives us a way to predict really easily under certain conditions, do I have more of my molecule in the protonated form or more of it in the deprotonated form? So always use, we can use pKa as the dividing line. If you get more acidic than the pKa, you have extra H pluses around, right? If you have extra H pluses around, you have extra protonated form. On the flip side, if your pH is above pKa, it's more basic, right? And if it's more, more basic means less protons around. Less protons around means all, all of a sudden you're more likely to find it in the deprotonated form. Right? So this is kind of my favorite way to to conceptually think about what's happening with these organic acids and bases when we're in the lab. If you want something to be protonated, you just have to put it into a solution that's where the pH is less than, than that molecule's pKa, and it'll be protonated. If you want something deprotonated, you do the opposite. You make sure you put it in a solution where the pH is above the pKa. And remember, I, I started this by talking about how changing protonated versus deprotonated, adding a charge or moving or removing a charge by protonated or deprotonated affects solubility, right? So if you want to know what molecule or what pH you have to get to to make something soluble with water, you look at the pKa. So here's an example. Put benzoic acid in water. And since we haven't done any nomenclature yet, benzoic acid is a benzene ring with an acid group attached to it. You put benzoic acid in water. What are the products going to be? The deprotonated form, right? Which um, for these acids, you just, if you do the reverse, if you go back to naming acids from Gen Chem, like nitrate, when it's an acid, it was nitric acid. Undo that benzoic acid when you deprotonate it, drop the ick, and add eight back. Ben benzoate, but yeah. And I bring that up mostly because everybody's heard of benzoate before, right? It's a preservative. It's in, it's in like every packaged food. Um, it is fairly harmless. And it dissolves in water pretty well because it's got a negative charge. So let's say we take benzoic acid and we put it into a solution. And after we add the benzoic acid and get it to dissolve, the solution has a pH of 7.2. The pKa of benzoic acid is 4.2. Which form is more present, is more um, common at a pH of 7.2? The protonated or deprotonated form? So because the deprotonated form because we're above our pKa, more basic than our pKa. If, it, if the pH was 4.2, we'd say we have 50-50, right? The fact that our, we have 7.2 means we have um, fewer protons around, so we're more likely to find it in the deprotonated form. If we took this solution and we kept adding an acid, we just added HCl to it until we got below 4.2, we switch over. 
And at the PKA is when you're 50 50. And so just always use that to qualitatively make it pretty easy to see whether it's going to be the protonated or depronated. If we wanted to make sure that as much of this was soluble in water, we wanted to maximize the solubility in water, we want the protonated form or the deprotonated form? Why? The deprotonated form has a charge. <laughs> yeah, when we when we pull the proton off, it's charged now, right? So this is the form that's more soluble in water. So we won't, we would want to keep it in a basic solution to maximize the solubility. And just to make the point of, um, one more time about um, the log scale. If we actually go back to that equation, pH equals pKa plus log of deprotonated over protonated. Every time you've got a difference of one between these two, that's a factor of 10 difference in this ratio. Right, because if you say, okay, if I plug in 7.2 and 4.2, if I subtract 4.2, I get three, it's my difference, right? If I'm solving for this ratio, I then take both sides and 10 to the power of both sides, right? Undo the log. So we get a ratio of deprotonated to protonated, it's 10 to the third. In other words, a thousand to one, we favor the deprotonated form. So every one pH unit you are away from pKa is a factor of 10 that you favor the protonated versus the deprotonated, which makes it really easy to judge. Like when we, if we want to say, I want to put 99% of my molecules in the deprotonated form, you need to be at least two pKa units above the P, um, pKa, the pKa units, pH units above pKa. Right, so it just gives a really easy way to qualitatively look at which one's favored and by roughly how much. So we should give that reaction over to the left by adding hydroxide. So however, would that just uh, precipitate out the yeah? So a lot of times what you'll what you'll see is you'll start making a precipitate, or at the very least, what we do a lot of times is we'll have um We'll set it up so that you have an organic solvent and a and a water layer on top of each other, so they're touching each other. And then if you if you acidify or uh, make the the water solution more basic, it's not just necessarily that it precipitates out because we can wind up some super saturated solutions if you do that. That's not always a convenient way to do it. Um, what you do instead is you say, well, it can be dissolved in the non-polar solvent or it can be dissolved in water. And by changing whether it's protonated or deprotonated, you change which of those it favors. It'll favor being dissolved in water if it's charged. It'll favor being dissolved in the non-polar layer if it's not charged. But yet yeah, you can, in theory, change the pH and watch stuff precipitate out at even organic molecules um, just by looking at this. It's just a little bit less reliable. Um, and the other advantage to doing the liquid-liquid extraction that way is that you can, you can, let's say that you got it so that 80% of your molecule went into the nonpolar layer. You can drain the nonpolar layer off and leave the water layer there and do it again and get 80% of what's left. And do it again so you can get eight and then so that 80% of the 20 that's left, if you, now you're looking at about 90 something percent of it out. You can do that even one more time and you can get really good yields by doing it repeated repeatedly. Versus if you, if you get it to crystallize out, it's a lot harder to do that because you have to separate a solid from liquid. It's a lot easier to separate two liquids from each other than it is to separate a solid from liquid. Um, especially if you can keep both solid, both of the liquid layers, which is, I believe, what we're doing in lab today is using what's called a separatory funnel. It's a funnel, it's kind of like a burette valve at the bottom. So it's designed so that if you have two layers, you can drain the bottom layer off and leave the top layer behind, um, which is really handy for doing liquid-liquid extractions, the way we refer to that. All right, 
Um, we'll talk more about acidity and later, but let's end for today or for a lecture anyway. And um, we'll start by doing the recrystallization in in lab, and then I'll have a, another lab exercise for us to work on that'll have us just learning some more lab skills. It won't be directly tied into what we're talking about necessarily, but we're just getting getting OCHEM lab skills up to date. Not up to date because you guys haven't ever had it before. Um, up to snuff, maybe. <laughs>